Very grateful for your presence, uh, each and every single person here. Um, we are going to get to our, our, our main topic shortly because it's, we're going to try to hit a lot of things. But on this day, so uh, can I can I ask you all a question, just real quick? Um, I'm going I'm to ask you guys to get out there a little bit. Okay, perdone, okay? Les voy a preguntar algunas cosas, tal vez un poco personales. Um, how many of you feel that the whole club scene isn't the best thing for your faith? ¿Cuántos de ustedes piensan que salir a las discotecas no es lo mejor para tu vida espiritual? Levanten la mano. Okay, you know, all right. But, but how many of you wish that the church could maybe give you some positive alternatives? Right? And like, you know, there's only so many quinceañeras and weddings that your family has. Right? There's only so many times that you go to these things because of your family. And, and, uh, and I just want to say, last night we had a, uh, a beautiful dinner and dance for Julissa Espinal. Um, who, 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 was, who was there last night? <laughs> and so all the people who just raised their hand, they're the ones who look really tired and they have like arrugas and everything because they, they slept like a, they went to sleep at 3 in the morning. Uh, pero yo pienso que ellos comparten la opinión que yo tengo de que fue una gran bendición. Let me describe what it was real quick. Like, Almost all the ministries in the city had a representative there because Julissa was part of like a lot of these ministries. <laughs> so, so like people from JDV, people from the Jornalistas, people from the Centro Carismatico, people from Corazón Puro, and like all these different people, and it felt like a family reunion, right? It felt like, hey, how are you doing? Like, I felt so blessed because I was like, I saw the kids that I baptized, like, running around. They're like really big and stuff. Couples that I had married. It was just like really beautiful. It felt like a family reunion. And if you've done ministry in New York for a long time, you would have, you would have, you would have felt that way. I think that we need more of that. In my opinion, yo pienso que nosotros necesitamos más de eso. Ocasiones. Cuando no hay nada malo. Bueno, pues es muy bueno de que tengamos eventos. Es súper bueno que tengamos retiros. Let's, let's plan events. Let's do retreats. Let's see each other there. But it was so good to just be with each other. You know what I mean? Does anybody know what I mean? Yeah. Can a brother get an amen? amen? Okay. Well, Corazón Puro is going to organize a gala. Where, yo, I want you all to come out like, yo, that super fly suit that you have in your closet forever, you've been waiting for an occasion to put that thing on, right? The dress that you have in the closet, que tal vez ya no te queda pero, you want to get back there. You want to, you want to, yes, you're going to get back into that size, whatever. This is going to give you, so I'm going to give you a couple months of best notice. <laughs> Maybe we should have like a, like a, a weight, like a collective, like a goal. I don't know, get nervous. Uh, on November 8th, Corazón Puro is going to organize a gala. And it's going to be in Manhattan, over where we do Catholic Underground. You guys know where that place is? Our Lady Good Council on 90th Street. And el propósito es, queremos mostrar la belleza de, de lo que está pasando aquí en el Bronx, en Brooklyn, en, en, en Westchester, en, en Rockland, en todos esos lugares donde los ministerios están floreciendo para la gloria de Dios. Queremos mostrar esa belleza porque hay muchas personas que no saben de, de que eso está pasando. There's a lot of people who don't know what's going on in the inner city. And let me tell you what, what God is doing in the inner city is crazy good. It's amazing. And, and I think people need to know. So we're going to invite our friends from like, you know, the other side of 42nd Street. <laughs> 
you know, the people who live on like 14th Street, you know, all those wonderful people, we want, to, we want them to come up too because we want to share the beauty of our culture, you know, the beauty, so we're, we're working on a theme, you know, we're choosing colors, we're gonna, we're gonna have great food, great music, I thought we had, hey, you know, we want to raise some money so that we can continue to go on missions. Así es que, November 8th, we're gonna do a gala, and so if you just want to come and be, we invite you. And, and please invite your ministries so that you guys can have a representative there. And hey, you never know, okay? You never know when you're going to find that special someone. Amen. Amen. No, I'm serious. That Back in the day, that's how people met their, like, you know, there's all these couples that have been married for like 40, 50 years. You ask them, where did you meet? Oh, we met at a church dance. <laughs> dancing with all the boys and you didn't ask me. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> hey, you never know, okay? <laughs> so, when is the gala de Corazón Puro? November 8th. Okay, ojalá no vemos. We'll have more information to be aware of what's going on in the world and having a Catholic answer. Porque si nosotros somos líderes, entonces eso quiere decir que a nosotros nos van a preguntar. Y la iglesia que dice es, and so, we want you to have an answer, like it says in the first letter of Peter, have a ready answer for your faith. So, thanks be to God, we live in New York, and we got some experts, yo. <laughs> for real. Okay, so, uh, we have a panel. This is the uh, Primer Impacto. <laughs> we all we need is like... <laughs> Uh, so we have a panel, we're going to have a panel discussion, uh, and uh, different people are going to present different situations. Este, si alguien aquí tal vez lucha un poquito con el inglés, les pido por favor, este, tal vez un servidor uh, puede traducir. Uh, we're just going to ask the, the people to just speak in one language. If you speak in English, you speak in English. If you speak in Spanish, you speak in Spanish. Así es que, if somebody struggles a little bit with, uh, with, with Spanish, um, can, can uh, some of the servers just, uh, maybe, uh, let me ask uh, Jennifer, you're back there. Okay, so Jennifer is going to translate. Uh, if anybody wants to just go towards there, you know, we'll just, she'll just kind of like circle up, uh, por si acaso. And then, and then uh, over here, Catherine is going to, can you raise your hand? Okay. Uh, Gio or Catherine will translate on this side, if anybody, si alguien quiere traducción, Aquí la servidor, las servidoras eh, Gio y Jennifer y Ka Catherine. It's good to see you here, Mika. Qué bueno que viniste, sorry. She's OG. She's, she's an OG. Um, so, without further ado then, uh, let me go ahead and invite uh, the, the panel up. Uh, Brother Teresiano uh, is... Uh, Un fraile mexicano creado en Michoacán. He is going to be uh, speaking to us about the situation in the Middle East, Iraq, and Israel. Ha uh, llegado Yasmin. She's not here yet. Okay, Yasmin is an immigration lawyer who has been working a lot, especially with the unaccompanied minors and the human trafficking situation that's going on with them. Ella este, está viniendo de Connecticut, así es que me imagino que ella todavía está en el camino. Um, so this would be a great time to uh, give her a call if you have her number to see where she's at. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about Ferguson, but let me let me hand the mic over to uh, Father Katursky. Father Joseph Katursky, uh, he, he teaches philosophy, amongst other things, at Fordham University. Uh, and he's going to kind of like be our our uh, our guru here, uh, Catholic guru. Um, and to, to, it's one thing to know what's going on. It's another thing to know what the response of Christ is in what's going on. Amen? Y uno tiene que tener ese deseo de no solamente informarse, pero también de informarse de lo que el Evangelio trae a esa situación. So what the gospel brings to that situation with the teaching of the church and its long tradition, Father Katursky is gonna, gonna help us out with. So he's gonna give us an intro, then we're gonna go through these, like a little potpourri of, of, of the situations, and then he's gonna wrap it up and we're gonna do Q&A. Amen, amen? Amen. 
Un aplauso fuerte. Buenas tardes. Yo quiero que puedo hablar en español con ustedes, pero no es tan fácil para mí. Lo siento. I wish I could. Uh, let me speak for just a minute or two to set this up, and then I will invite my, my colleagues up to uh, present a little bit about the various situations that they are considering. The church has a very interesting moral tradition that can be applied to many of these issues, like situation in Iraq and Afghanistan, situation in Ferguson, and the various other things that we might want to consider. Let me say two things by way of a general introduction, get more specific on one point, and then I'll invite my colleagues up. First general point, the church has a different stance than secular society does, and than some fundamentalist Protestants do. That is, the church always understands on these matters that moral reasoning means both theology and philosophy. That is, we really understand that there's some things you can only get from revelation, and we insist that there's some things that revelation doesn't directly cover, and so you only get it from reasoning. And that you have to do the two and that ultimately the two will never conflict. Most in our secular society want to do it from some pattern of reasoning or other. And they want to use only secular reasoning. And they don't want any influence from the gospel. But they're missing something. So one of the things that we do when we give a Catholic response to any of these issues in morality of any sort we always say, there has got to be reasoning, but it can't only be human reasoning. Whereas some of our very dear, but nonetheless fundamentalist Protestant brothers, sisters, they want to say you get it all from revelation, from faith, and they're really leery about bringing any real reasoning to bear. Whereas the church always insists on both. That is, they always insist that there's elements of both that you need to bring in, and if you don't do both, you're not going to get a really Catholic response to this. You'll get an interesting biblical response, but sometimes, for instance, what exactly does the Bible say about cloning? No. Not too much. I mean, I wish it said a little more, but I don't know that by itself it says anything. So you're going to need at least some contributions of reasoning. There are going to be things on which you will find real clarity within Revelation and sometimes reasoning gets cloudy. This is my second general point and it's simply the value of every human person. From Revelation we know, you know this from Genesis. In the beginning God made the heavens and the earth and then on the sixth day God made man and he made man in the image and according to the likeness of God himself. Well, for that reason, we think that each and every human being, whether tiny little being just beginning in the mother's womb, or somebody who's at the end stages of life, very, very ill and non-responsive, or even people in between who are living fine lives but are under the press of a given gut, no matter where, we regard each and every human being as having an intrinsic dignity because made in the image and likeness of God. Whereas, unfortunately, in some forms of secular reasoning, this is not the case, right? Any effort on the part of a secular pattern of reasoning in these matters can very easily say, well, we'll try to save the greater part even if it means the cost of the lesser part. We are willing to have a smaller portion, a minority portion, suffer or even die for the sake of the larger group. Well, even the members of the smaller group are still made in the image and likeness of God. So the, the utilitarian patterns of reasoning that tries to treat us as just one commodity, one little item among others, 
They can't get any good answers if they don't respect the truth that comes from Revelation. Am I okay so far? So the general thesis, just to repeat it first, the church always insists on faith and reason, that is on theology based on the scriptures and on good reasoning. Not just one, not just the other. Secondly, we really do respect and insist upon the dignity of each human being. It may never be directly attacked. Now let me just give one example and then I'm going to invite my colleagues up because they're going to want to discuss all the facts of the case and bring up interesting perspectives and pose interesting problems. Here's the one case. I think it's going to get talked about anyway. Over at Fordham, I often give a course on war and peace. And in that course on war and peace, and I'm a philosopher, although I do also have a little bit of commitment here to the theological side. <laughs> in that course on war and peace, I start the course in this way. We're going to do six weeks of theory and then six, seven, eight weeks of cases. What these folks are going to do is bring up some cases, I think. But here's the basic theory. In philosophical theory about war and peace, there are three main theories. In fact, this is going to be very good for you to know. I was watching your hands before when Father Augustino was asking you how many have either asked some questions about Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Syria or how many have been asked. The three main positions on that matter are realism, pacifism, and just war. What those positions mean is this. Pacifism means the position, you may never use lethal force, not any individual, not any country. You should find ways to solve your problem, but never resort, resort to lethal force. War is forbidden. I give two weeks on that, so that we're sure to understand the arguments. And some of the arguments are religious. When Jesus, for instance, takes that sword that Peter used, <laughs> and Peter is ready to solve some of his problems by violence and Jesus always insists those who live the by the sword will die by the sword. Now, some people use that as an argument for Christian pacifism. I think that's actually taking that particular item out of context. I don't think that Jesus forbids the use of lethal force. But I can see that some people do, and some people, often of a religious mindset, try to say we should be pacifists. The realists, the second position, are the ones who want to say there is no moral principle that should govern warfare. It's simply a matter of national politics, realistic politics, the stronger is going to win. War is like economics, and that, for their point of view, morality doesn't count. Their reasoning is entirely utilitarian, greater benefit, smaller burden. If a few people get killed or injured along the way, we'll try to minimize those consequences. But all we're doing is minimizing the hurt. We're not saying that there's anybody who's intrinsically right or intrinsically dignified. The third position, the one that's most often been the Catholic position, is called the just war theory. And in the just war theory, we use some elements from Revelation, and some elements from reasoning. But in the just war position, I'll, it would take longer to explain the details of that than I have right here. So I'm just going to outline it in general. We may well get into it in the further conversation. But in the just war theory, in order to use lethal force to be justified in doing it, you've got to meet a number of important conditions. First, there has to be a really just cause. Somebody has had to been an aggressor against somebody else and had no moral right to do so. So we have to have a genuine aggressor, that's your just cause. The people who are going to resort to lethal force, for instance, the home army defending the country, has got to have the right intention. That is, you've got to intend to stop the aggressor, not to conduct a new war of aggression on your own. Third, you've got to use licit means, so you can't simply use nothing but uh, daisy cutters against a civilian population. Right? You've got to respect the fact that there are innocent people there and you've got to have legitimate targets. And above all, you've got to make sure that you have 
taken every other means to try to avoid the use of force. So you've got to do the negotiations at considerable length. You might have to use economic sanctions at considerable detail before you could ever be in the position of using lethal force. Much more to be said on all those things, but just by way of introduction, you get the impression why the Catholic Church is not pacifist, nor is it quote-unquote real. That's part of the reason problems we have with immigration is, is there are many reasons that people immigrate, right? And one of the main reasons probably most of our families came to this country was for a better future, for a better life. And I go to Essex County and past year I've been working specifically with immigrants and at first the immigrants I would work with were men who had been living here for many years who have all their families here and somehow they, they got in trouble with the law or they even just got picked up and they're, now they're in jail and they're going to be deported it doesn't matter if they have all their families up here. So it's a very difficult situation because most of them tell me that they're going to come right back. But if they come right back and they, they, they get caught in the border or anywhere, because they have a deportation, they can do up to two years. And that's usually what they do get two years just for crossing the border if you had been deported before. But these men take that risk because they, they have nothing left in their countries. But in recent months, I'd say four or five months from now, I started working with these younger guys who came in. And they're all like in their early 20s, 18, 19. And the reason for coming to this country is a, a different reason than the other, the older men. And most of these guys are from Central America, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. And every time I speak to one of these guys, it's, it's almost the same story, one after the other. The main reason they left their country was to save their lives, essentially. Because somehow the gangs put up a, a rent or they had to pay a tax. And some of them paid a tax for a while and then they just couldn't. I mean, the, the rents that these gangs put are just sometimes just ridiculous, you know. They're so high. And some of them have have been threatened, and they, they will kill them if they don't pay the rent. I, I, so this is most of the, the stories I hear. And then the other day I heard a story of a guy who was on the other side in Honduras. He actually was working for some drug dealers down there, cartel. And their life was fine for him until one day his boss came up to him and told him he gave him a, a little piece of paper I guess with the names of these persons that his boss was asking him to kill and he knew this family I mean he said he told me that they were like his neighbors he knew them all so he told his boss that he was going to think about it of course, he thought about it, and just, there was no way he could do it. So he started stop showing up to all the activity of his cartel boss, and uh, he got a threat a threat letter in his house that he had to leave town, or they were going to kill him. So he left town, and now he's most of these guys have been gone gotten caught in Texas in the border. 
and now they're in federal custody. So we have two, two reasons, two situations here. The first we came to just to uh, look for a better life. And these, this new generation or this new exodus that we're seeing is that they're leaving because they want to live. And they know that if they stay in their countries, they'll, they'll, get, they'll get killed. That's it. These cartels, these gang members, they don't care about anybody. So what I do is I can't do much. I, mean, I just go and give them a little hope, you know. Then did you read you a little quote from the Bible? Hebrews 13, 3. It says, Do not neglect to show hus hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them, and those who are ill-treated. So that's essentially what I'm, I try to do. I don't know if you guys remember uh, about two years ago in Honduras, it was the biggest prison fire in the history of the world. 365 men died there. And about two weeks ago, I was at the jail in Essex County. And I was talking to this guy from Honduras, and we started speaking. And he said that he had been in prison in Honduras, so I asked him where, and he said, Kumayawa, and I couldn't believe it. And I told him, I used to go to that prison. And his eyes just got wide, you know, big. And he started mentioning some people that were in prison at that prison. And I, I knew some of these guys, and he knew the guys that I knew. So it was just amazing. And the one thing he told me was, even though the situation was bad in prison down there, he said, he said, it's, I think it's worse up here. Because down there, they have much more liberty in the prisons. They can walk around, you know, in the gardens and whatever. And up here, especially these guys who are detained in the county jail, they're locked up 24-7. They get one hour to stretch your legs a day. So I, I just couldn't believe that he, he said that it was harder to be in prison up here. So my word to each one of you is, first of all, is what, the, what we read, that we should remember the prisoners as if we were suffering with them. I do not have the answers for this situation. Hopefully Father Katursky will show us, teach us a little bit of how we can go about solving this, uh, this new exodus. God bless you. I, I forgot to mention one of our panelists, uh, Glennie Coates is going to, uh, <laughs> Glennie Coates. Uh, she's studying public health and uh, she's going to uh, give us a little bit of a lowdown on what's going on with the uh, Ebola virus uh, epidemic. Uh, but let me go ahead and um, speak on what I was going to speak on. Um, on Saturday, August 9th at 12.01 p.m., uh, Michael Brown was shot six times in Ferguson, Missouri. And this event that happened in one minute uh, has led to so many different 
scenes that perhaps we have seen, uh, things that perhaps we're not even um, sure if that's, if that's in this country. It is, and it's happening. Uh, I even read this morning that uh, Greenpeace, no, no, Human Rights Inter Am Amnesty International, Amnesty International launched its first ever mission to the United States. These are the people that go to areas where like human rights are being violated. They've never had to come into the United States until now. Uh, and so there are many, many events that, that have gone on. You can find the different timelines. Uh, some of the main points I'll mention very briefly. A young man, 18 years old, was shot allegedly uh, after a struggle for the officer's weapon. The officer was not mentioned, not named, uh, and the authorities said the reason why is because there was death threats. Eventually his name was released and uh, his record released and uh, because he is a, a public uh, a public defendant, he's a, he's a, he's a policeman, he's a, um, and so, uh, so they, they did so. There was autopsies done, protests, there was rioting that happened uh, two days after he was shot and then there was rioting again, there was a curfew, the National Guard was sent in. Uh, our President, President Obama, sent um, the Attorney General in kind of an unprecedented move. Uh, and so there's a lot happening. Uh, there was a string of about three nights where tear gas was used uh, against the protesters. The protesters violated curfew, a curfew imposed by the governor. Uh, various times and so these are the facts these are the things that we know that happened what's the underlying situation that's going on well it's kind of it's kind of two there is uh, a human rights aspect to this was this young man um, in, a, in, in a sense murdered uh, what's the difference between murder and self-defense uh, this is something that we can't really answer right now until the investigation uh, comes to completion. Uh, it is possible that somebody uh, could have murdered this young man, and murder is quite different from self-defense, as you know. Uh, and it could be very possible that this officer was acting to defend himself. The uh, principle is, is self-defense, and you can find it in the Catechism uh, paragraph 2263, uh, so if you just Google Catechism of the Catholic Church 2263, you'll read this. The legitimate defense of persons and societies is not an exception to the prohibition against among which is the inviolable right of every innocent being to life. I mean, long story short, <coughs> if somebody comes at you, you have a right to defend yourself. That force has to be proportional. Meaning, if somebody steps on your toe, you can't take out your Glock and put a, put a couple of bullets in it, okay? That's not proportional. Uh, and you do have a right to defend yourself. The value of your life is, is meant to be defended. And there is 10% of the fatalities of the police in this country are with their own weapon. So it is a legitimate fear amongst our, our police officers that someone will take their weapon and use it to kill them. Uh, it has happened before and those, those statistics are current, meaning last year 10% of all the policemen who were killed were killed with their own weapon. Um, and so that, that, is, that is one thing and let's set that apart. We pray and hope that the investigation will bring the truth out. And we pray for all the families involved because uh, Michael Brown's family will never have their son back. Regardless of what he did, uh, they will never have him back. And this officer, his career will never be the same, to say the least. Uh, so we should, we should pray for both of them. Uh, let me give a word now as a man of color who knows what it's like to be pulled over just because of what you look like. Um, this is a separate issue, and this is an issue that we should deal with justly. Having lived in the inner city for a very long time, I know sometimes it feels like there's like a, a force that's pressed against you. And just because you're dressed a certain way, just because you look a certain way, it's always assumed, like 
like, no fellas. Like, how many of you see a very nice looking family or, you know, a person uh, of Caucasian descent walking on the sidewalk and you see them see you and they cross the street and they walk across the street? Like, ah, oh, has that happened to you guys? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, it's like, okay. Yeah. No damage, no damage, no damage. I can't control what the people uh, have, have been through, but I can control their perception of me today. Uh, they say that the most, important of your, the most important moment of your life is the one you have right now, because it's the only one you've got. Um, and it's a gift. That's why they call it the present. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> By the way, that's not from that's not from Kung Fu Panda. That's from Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Okay, I'm just saying. Um, so there is there is this aspect of things, and I just want to quote uh, a study that was released in the early 70s. Uh, this was a study done uh, by a, a major think tank in, in down in D.C. called the Rand Corporation, uh, and the report was called Rebellion and Authority. Uh, and these two uh, authors, uh, they said, fundamental to our analysis is the assumption that the population, as individuals or groups, behaves rationally, that it calculates costs and benefits to the extent that they can be related to different courses of action and makes choices accordingly. Consequently, influencing popular behavior requires neither sympathy nor mysticism, but rather a better understanding of what, it co of what costs and benefits the individual or the group is concerned with and how they are calculated. Repeat. Influencing popular behavior requires neither sympathy nor mysticism, but rather a better understanding of what costs and benefits the individual or the group is concerned with and how they are calculated. Uh, this has been translated in public authority and enforcing uh, the law, the executive branch of our government, uh, broad stroke. Obviously, I'm not going to explain everything. If there was a policeman right here, he'd say that's not, that's not completely true, and I would agree with him. Um, it, if, has anyone ever heard of the broken windows theory? Broken windows theory is basically says that you enforce every single law, even the most minute things, and that's going to bring crime down as a whole. I'm simplifying it, but uh, here in Staten Island, we saw um, perhaps uh, an attempt at enforcing that when a, uh, a man of African-American descent was uh, being arrested for selling uh, cigarettes illegally and was put in a chokehold and he later died. This enforcing of everything, even, even the, smallest, um, uh, the, the smallest breaking of the law, I am saying, I can say personally, and I can say as a priest, has diminishing returns. Because it comes to a point where, uh, where maybe you're pushing too much. Uh, it is my opinion that the officer who had that man in a chokehold uh, should have let him go after he repeated the third time, I can't breathe. That's my opinion. That's going to be investigated as well. I spoke to a police officer on Sunday. And it's great to have a police officer's perspective. Because you know what, man? These guys, they're trying. And when you meet them, you get to know them, guess what? They're humans like us. And it says in 1 Samuel chapter 15, 23, that the sin of rebellion is akin to witchcraft. And so I think that we also have to recognize that righteous anger does not have the right to erupt into unrighteous violence. And this is what has happened, nor does it mean that the legitimate authority has the right to use extreme force, which I guess we'll, what we're going to be talking about in the next, next couple of weeks in, 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 the, uh, in the public forum. But this is what's happening. So we have a couple different situations here, and it's not just in Ferguson. It's right here in Staten Island. There was a film that went viral of a, of a highway patrolman beating forcefully a woman on, on a California highway. Uh, there was another shooting of a man in St. Louis. Uh, th these things are happening. And so the, the, the concepts that we need to know 
is that someone does have the right to defend themselves. We do have the right to protest what we think is something unjust, but that right does not allow us to do violence, in this case looting, or uh, perhaps uh, vengeance killing either. Uh, and so this is some of the things that, that, that face us, uh, although there can be legitimate attempts at keeping uh, order for the sake of the common good, there are certain things that uh, perhaps the broken windows theory enforced to a fault that does not benefit society. Uh, and the Christian virtues of solidarity and, and charity uh, have a stronger voice in situations like this. I mean, like right here, we live in the South Bronx. There's a police department right down the road, and a lot of our kids, they were part of something called uh, Explorers. Anybody was, a, was a, one of those Explorers? Um, uh, a, what is it called? A PAL, uh, Police Athletic League. These were six men equals boogeyman. Um, and yo, seriously, that's how I grew up. The, the enforcement of, 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 of authority in my family wasn't, I'm going to tell your dad, was, I'm going to call the police. Uh, pay for my hitting. <laughs> um, and so these are some of the bridges that need to be made, but we must take it upon ourselves to make them. Uh, rebellion for the sake of rebellion to a legitimate authority is like, what, do you, what are you afraid of? What are you hiding? Um, and it should be, uh, even, if, even if it's something like racial profiling, which isn't legitimate, if you are racially profiled, take a deep breath, offer it up for the souls of purgatory, and there might be more good done than bad from this situation. I'm actually um, finishing a program at Mount Sinai School of Medicine on disease prevention and health promotion under the public health track. And um, public health has been on the front lines this summer with Ebola virus. So, um, as you all know, um, as you all know, um, this past summer there was one of the biggest outbreaks of Ebola in history in Africa. Biggest outbreak because they comprise the four countries. Um, specifically, from the United States, there were two missionary workers from Samaritan Purse, and that's actually an international missionary program. Uh, they were working in Liberia, and they were treating patients with Ebola, and they contracted the disease. Fortunately, they were able to be flown into the United States. They were in Emory um, Healthcare Center, um, and they were given experiments. We're going to talk about it more later, but um, uh, luckily now they're disease-free. Um, there's been a big concern uh, with government agencies working together with international public health uh, facilities and uh, agencies such as United Nations, CDC, and the World Health Organization. What is Ebola? So a lot of you here might be like, oh yeah, I think I've heard of it. I think it's like a disease that I catch when somebody coughs on me. I think it's something that I saw in a movie years ago. We're going to talk about it later. But specifically, these are the two pictures of the Ebola virus. They're in different staining. Um, it's basically a severe illness causing damage of the immune system and organs. And this results in blood clotting cells, reduction of that level, which essentially is life threatening. Um, the person dies of bleeding, uncontrollable bleeding outside the body and inside the body. There are five types of this Ebola virus, three of which have been affiliated with the outbreak in Africa. Uh, there's the BDB. Uh, BDBB, the EBOB, and the SUDB. You don't need to remember those. Ultimately, those are the ones responsible. Luckily, we were able to find them. It's important to know about the REST virus, that rests on Ebola virus. That specific virus was found in the Philippines and in China. Historically, it has been found in the United States. It's specific, it's good to know, because this is a type of Ebola virus, but you don't have symptoms. So the people who have this type of infection have it in their blood, but do not show the classical symptoms that result in death that we're going to discuss in a few minutes. Transmission. That's our biggest problem in public health. How can we stop this Ebola virus from spreading? 
So whatever what happened in Africa was that there was a person who traveled from Liberia who had this disease. From who had this disease, who had the virus, um, traveled to another country, and specifically, this might be the fifth country that might be um, part of the outbreak. But he went on a plane, exhibited symptoms on the plane, told officials. Once he got off the plane, actually they detoured the plane, got him off the plane, and they found out that he's had the virus. So now they're trying to basically do damage control. They're going back into the plane, figure out who he had exposure to, so you can only imagine. Human to human transmission in community. So if you're in a community, um, in Africa specifically, communication on staying away or, or kind of hindering communication with an infected person has not been communicated. So that's the easiest way an entire village or an entire region can be um, infected. Specifically, direct and indirect contact to the blood secretions, um, sweat, saliva. If you've had any type of exposure to a person who's had this virus, you're more than likely going to contract the virus. Um, specifically, the, um, there have been misconceptions on how you get this. So, um, some people say, oh, well, if I breathe, maybe uh, next to a person. So, ultimately, it's not airborne. You don't get it through oxygen. It's not waterborne. You don't get it through drinking the same water. Um, you don't really get it from foods, because we'll talk in a few seconds about how, what animals have to do with this virus. Um, but as long as you cook the raw, the meat of the animals to a certain temperature, you can be free of the disease. Um, in their contact has to easily do when somebody, let's say, in a village, they could just spit on a counter, and you could just rub your hand later on, rub your eye, and that's another way of contracting the virus. Um, the most common place which is curious on obtaining, there is the contracting this virus, is in burial ceremonies. What happens is that you have the deceased individual in a burial ceremony and everyone, family, friends are in a contained environment, a closed environment, and has contact with the body or with the corpse. So most people who have contracted disease have traced back to being part of the ceremony of a person who's had this disease. Healthcare facilities, which is what happened with our two missionaries in Africa, but also laboratory workers. If you have not disposed of the specimen in the right manner, you are exposing yourself to the serum, to the blood, to the feces of the person that you're examining. Also, where you are putting these items exposes everyone else. Um, typically, our most common outbreaks also just a common factor, or how we call it public health a confounder, has been that it's been found in tropical rainforests and in very uh, rural areas. Animal exposure. So, who here remembers the movie Outbreak with Dustin Hoffman, Rene Russo? There was some truth to that movie in the sense that there was a virus that went out in Africa. They transferred a chimpanzee to the United States who had this virus and all of a sudden there was an outbreak. The truth is that um, this virus originates from animals. Um, the false part is that in the movie it was airborne. This is not airborne because remember, it's not through the air, it's not through the oxygen, it's through direct contact through secretions. Um, so fruit bats, primates such as chimpanzees, gorillas, um, have the type of virus that basically they're responsible for this infection, for this outbreak. Um, they are considered zoonosis. Zoonosis is basically when you have an infection or virus that originates from an animal, and it has, and once you have wildlife, so human transmission, you obtain that virus from the animal, which necessarily does not damage the animal, but can be contagious and life-threatening to humans. Um, as we said before, the breast virus in pigs, uh, which was found in um, Asia is not responsible for the symptoms that we're talking about. The biggest, the earliest e Ebola outbreak has been linked to primates, which is how they have stigma through macaque monkeys, um, gorillas, and chimpanzees to be responsible for this. Um, typically, especially in rural areas, remember we were talking about exposure in rural and rainforests. Sometimes when there's an infected animal who's been lying there, let's say the carcass is there, handling of that animal or of their feces or anything else also causes direct exposure. And um, basically public health and health literacy has been a challenge in public health on communicating to farmers as well as families on proper um, disposal of that specimen. Symptoms, signs and symptoms. So who here remembers from the New York Post a few weeks ago, actually it was in July, 
um, that there was a person who was in Mount Sinai Medical Center. So, of course, I opened my inbox and everything is red because um, basically they were in high alert. They developed a protocol together with the CDC and this goes along with every hospital system at this point in the, in the world on a protocol on how to handle patients who have vascular symptoms. Now we're going to clarify on how he basically was cleared. A um, person who comes into the emergency room or healthcare facility who exhibits the following symptoms, sudden onset of fever, intense weakness, muscle pain, headache, sore throat, followed by a few days after, vomiting, diarrhea, rash, internal exterior bleeding, basically those are the first frontline signs of the virus. When we do lab testing or when we do a, a physical exam, we rule every other illness such as malaria, such as influenza before the person is diagnosed with Ebola virus. Um, there's also kidney function, low platelet count. Because the person's throwing up a lot, there's also decreased levels of magnesium, potassium, and calcium. Um, so that's why, as part of a treatment measure, they're basically rehydrated and they're given solutions with electrolytes. Uh, the case fatality rate, which is, and for all of those who want to pursue a life in public health, this is very important. Case fatality rate of 92%, which means in a certain period of time, the number of people dying within that period of time, 90%, that's almost 100% level of those who have contracted this virus who will die. So that's why there's an alarm. And it's important to know the differences of what this is and what this is not and what our brothers and sisters in these countries in Africa are going through. Treatment. Unfortunately, there is no vaccine for clinical use. There are a few experimental drugs that are undergoing evaluation. The two Americans that came to Emory Health Center were provided um, one of these experimental drugs, which is a rarity, to be honest. If you've done research, if you've worked in research, any experimental drug that has not been approved by the FDA that's been released. So they released a ZMAP antibody as one of the protocols that is being examined as don't take my word for it, as a possible use for clinical use for vaccinations. They're not saying that this is the one responsible, this is the one vaccination responsible for the healing or for the improvement of the health of these two missionary healthcare workers. But that's one of many uh, protocols or treatments that are being examined. Um, and basically it has to go through a whole battery series of experimental and clinical trials before it's being used for the wide public. The most important thing that's helped specifically with these two um, healthcare workers or missionary workers as well as um, everyone who survived this, um, this disease is intensive medical support. The benefit of taking these two missionary workers to Emory is that they're close to the CDC. The Center for Disease Control is number one in the world in terms of clinical trials as well as disease and contained environment for rare diseases, which is in this case. Um, oral and intravenous rehydration, again, with electrolytes, was very important. Another factor that was brought up is early detection. So that's what happened with this gentleman. He came into the emergency room. He said, I have gastro, he had fever of 106. Um, I believe he also had gastrointestinal um, problems in terms of diarrhea and vomiting. So that, but then again, his lab testing and everything else turned out negative. Um, but rehydration is the most important, I'm sorry, excuse me, Im immunity is the most important. Early detection is very important because you can catch it before it basically starts attacking the organs and the immune system. Prevention. Um, basically, wild, wildlife to human transmission, we said that this virus originates with animals. What they're trying to avoid uh, interaction between doing is that if they find a porcupine, if they find any type of animal dead, what they've done is they've burned the carcass um, and they basically have tried to dispose the, um, the specimen with approval of the CDC and the government. Reduce consumption of raw meats, part of uh, certain cultures in um, Africa has to do with um, basically eating raw meat. So they're encouraging them not to. Uh, risk to human to human transmission in community. So if you, they're being told if you know someone who has this disease or even exhibiting symptoms, they quarantine, they keep this person in a contained environment to avoid any sort of um, contact. Personal um, equipment, person, uh, protective equipment is important. And that has to do with goggles, masks, gloves, uh, gowns, long sleeve, even toes, any, any, any opening in the body that has to do with ears, eyes, nose, mouth, a cut, hangnail, that's an open, that's an open um, wound. 
that's a direct and easy way of you obtaining this. So that's really important and we're going to talk about it in a few seconds on how we can help with that factor. Uh, community, in terms of uh, communication, that's, again, public health, one of the biggest um, factors is health literacy. How do you translate all of this to a farmer? How do you translate all of this to a mother who does not know, who has never been to a doctor? So basically, there have been a very professional, and thankfully the government involvement, um, individuals who have spoken with families as well as community on proper burial mechanisms and how to reduce contact altogether with those who may be at risk. Uh, travel. Non-essential travel to these countries is prohibited. So unless you're part of the effort, if you're a healthcare worker or if you're an aide who's helping with the outbreak, you're not being, you're not permitted to enter these countries. If you're leaving the countries, um, they're asked that you're asking the passengers to complete a questionnaire on their health condition. Uh, there are also CDC as well as staff that are being trained on observation on exhibit on patients who may uh, come on board with symptoms. What does this mean to us? Um, currently, there are uh, no deaths. No, there's no outbreak in the United States. So please, if you go online and Google search this, know for a fact that there is no outbreak in the United States. Um, missionary workers is basically the framework of Corazón Puro, as well as many ministries represented here today. Prevention and proper knowledge of this disease, whether or not you're going to Africa or if you're going to any part of the country, you should really have an eye or have kind of um, knowledge on preventative measures. This includes traveling with a health kit, which basically contains uh, basic medical supplies, thermometers, goggles, protect, personal protective equipment, gloves, um, have immunization records. We cannot stress enough the importance of vaccination. Doesn't have to, the, the, just because there's no vaccination for Ebola doesn't mean that vaccination for the MMR, the tetanus, is not important. Building antibodies and immunity to things that you might be exposed to will be vital. So vaccinations need to be on point. Um, check with your insurance carriers. Doesn't hurt to try to call your insurance. So in the event that you do get sick, you can come back and you wouldn't have to worry about payment or possible care when you return to the United States. Identify in-country healthcare resources, uh, Red Cross, CDC representatives, if there's a big hospital system, if there's a local clinic, if you can be part of that clinic, it's good to find out before you travel. Don't be a reservoir for a disease. The best, you know when you travel and you come back and you have a cold, and all of a sudden everybody in your family has a cold? You were a reservoir. So ultimately, you were a host, you were a mechanism by which that virus has traveled from that country to here. So just please be aware in terms of your health and the fact that you might be responsible for, well, we're not going to wish for an outbreak, but you might be responsible for illnesses around you and those you might come in contact with. Human dignity and charity. So let's wrap it up in terms of our Catholic teaching. According to uh, Pope John Paul II in the Apostolic Letter on Christian Meaning of Human Suffering, Christ's redemption and saving grace embrace the whole person, especially in his or her illness, suffering, and death. Also, he states in uh, chapter 2 of the encyclical letter Evangelium Vitae, the words and deeds of Jesus and those in his of his church are not meant only for those who are sick or suffering or in some way neglected by society. On a deeper level, they affect the very meaning of every person's life in its moral and spiritual dimensions. Just because a person has a terminal disease doesn't mean that they have a right for medical care. Just because Ebola has a 90% rate of mortality or of death doesn't mean that resources are going to be reduced or hindered for that person versus another person who has another type of virus. If you, as missionary workers, we have to kind of keep part that everyone has an equal right to exposure to health care. This, this happens here or in anywhere you go. So it's important in terms of communication, conversation, or even um, even if you're anybody who's traveling or if you decide to be a part of a group, just to keep this in mind, uh, because that's basically the framework of missionary uh, charity. How can we help? You can um, contact the Catholic Relief, uh, Catholic Relief Services, um, and I believe they have, what they've been doing is that they're collecting personal protective equipment, as we mentioned before, goggles, thermometers, um, disposal, anything that you may have, you may want to reach them, even through funds. Uh, it might be helpful, it is going to be helpful for them in reaching these countries. Uh, missionaries of charity, there are also some of our missionaries out there. They may also need help as well as funds. So uh, just do your research and be a part of it. 
Be a public health representative in your community. Correct a person when, they've given, when they're asking you on Ebola or on any other virus. Um, give them correct information on preventative measures. Keep close watch of current events. So the same way with that gentleman, how he came into Mount Sinai and everyone thought that there was an outbreak and there are still news reports out there that there was an outbreak, just keep close watch because uh, we're not far away. This is historic. This has never happened before. Um, although there are um, restraints and borders on people traveling, you never know what's really going on or what may happen tomorrow. So just keep a close eye because it might affect you on your everyday life. Useful links. Um, BBC, CNN, ABC News, that's okay, that's awesome, but that type of media can be biased. If you want direct primary resource on this outbreak and any other outbreak, please uh, visit the World Health Organization, the Center for Disease Control, National Institute of Health, as well as UNICEF. Thank you. <laughs> I was very excited this week. I was going to give the talk, and the first time I ever did PowerPoint. As I say, oh, there. Oh, there. Oh, there. All right. PowerPoint. And I came and we went to load it up and it doesn't work. So, what are you going to do, right? I know. So, um, oh. so I'm going to present today not using PowerPoint, but I want to talk about uh, two areas of the Middle East that are kind of like really um, a lot of things going on right now. One, obviously, is much, well, they're both very, very serious, but one, the, the, the graphic nature of one is certainly a lot of people over the other. First, just to spend a few minutes on Israel. So we went to Ferguson, Missouri. Oh, well, wait, first we went to Newark and Missouri, then Mount Sinai. <laughs> Here we are in Israel. Okay, anybody been to Israel before? Yes, okay, a few, I've been to Israel as well. This is Israel right here. This is Egypt down here, Jordan, Syria, this is the Golan Heights, that is, and this is Lebanon up here. This is the West Bank, this is the Gaza Strip. This is the area I'm just going to spend a couple minutes explaining what's going on in the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip used to be part of Egypt, so Egypt used to own this. Um, and then in 1968, there was a war between Egypt and Israel. Israel took it over, okay? So they took it over. And uh, since 1968 to 2005, Israel, um, they had settlements there, about 10,000 settler, settlers. And they also, their military, uh, were the police force in Gaza Strip. Here's West Bank. This is where um, Palestinians live. There are, there are different checkpoints and, and it's very, very strict security over there if you've been to Israel, as you know. This looks small, doesn't it? This is smaller than Manhattan Island. 1.8, almost 2 million people live right here. Now, on Manhattan Island, I don't know, there's a, there's a couple million, right? There's a few million living on 2 million like that. Now, I don't know if you've noticed with the exception of Central Park, maybe. How many, like, fields do you see, right? Like, there's nobody living there, right? It's the same thing here. It's one of the most densely populated places on the planet. Almost two million people living here. Most of them are Muslim. 1,000 Christians live there. In 2005, Israel decides, the president says, well, we're going to pull out. All right, and we're going to leave it to the Palestinians, or the, the Palestinian National Liberation Movement, PLO, who run the West Bank. We're going to let them run the Gaza Strip. 2006, they have elections. Now, there was two main, there was one, the main party of the Palestinians is called Fatah, F-A-T-A-H. All right, and the president of Fatah is President Abbas, and he... He currently um, is the president of the West Bank. 2006, they have elections. Another group, Hamas. Anybody ever heard of Hamas? Yes, okay, everyone's heard of Hamas. Hamas actually gets a majority of the Democratic vote. They throw out Fatah, and they take over the Gaza Strip. Okay, so at that point, Egypt, this is their border right down here. Egypt seals their border. Israel seals their border, 
nobody in and nobody out. Well, what was what is Hamas? See, Fatah, they actually would like a an independent state, but they're very moderate. Hamas comes from the Egyptian Brotherhood, who just were in Egypt. They're um, a Sunni Muslim group. What they want is, and this will be related then to Iraq and Syria, what they want is, in a way, Sharia law, although they're not, they'll say they don't want that, but in, in essence, they want a, um, Father, what would that be? A, a, a religious state? Uh, be technocrat? Is it, uh, theocracy. Theocracy, yeah. So they would like a Muslim state there in Hamas. Now, there are almost two million people living there who are Muslim. They are innocent people. Yeah, they're Muslims and they go about their business. 70% of them live under the poverty level. Uh, unemployment is rampant. Do you know what happens when the majority of young men have nothing to do? Well, they stand on the street corners and cause problems, right? Well, the same thing is happening here. The, the, um, because of the blockade around the Gaza Strip, because of the dire poverty that is there right now, it is, in a way, breeding extremism in an extreme, if you will, Muslim faction. So, some are actually thinking that ISIS have a lot of influence now in the Gaza Strip. Hamas's response to the blockade, they fire rockets all over into Israel. They fire the rockets, some they make there in Gaza Strip, some were smuggled in from their friends in Iran. So Iran was smuggling. How do they smuggle? They built tunnels right here from Egypt into the Gaza Strip. Now, there was great international pressure put on the Israelis, these poor 2.2 2 million people, 1.8 million people, so the Israelis lessened their restrictions over the years from 2006 on to allow in food, fuel, um, different aid, including cement, concrete. Why do you need concrete? To build stuff, right? Well, guess what? Hamas built concrete tunnels so they could bring in arms and aid and rockets. Okay, so this is now, we have a, we have a conundrum here that Father Katursky is going to have to explain for us at the end, okay? <laughs> what do we do? So Egypt, Egypt interest, interestingly now, usually the United States was always kind of the people brokering this deal. Egypt is now taking the lead, trying to bring about a peace, because right now, it's been over a month, they're firing rockets. Israel is bombing. Now, guess what happens when you drop a bomb on Manhattan, right? There's no, like, they're sending rockets out of schools and people's houses. Guess what happens? There's a lot of fatalities, right? So, most of the Western world holds Hamas to be a terrorist organization, as does Israel. There's a lot of pressure on Israel now to lift the blockade. Israel's uh, president and Palestinian President Abbas were just at the Vatican with Pope Francis, where they had a nice meeting, they had a prayer service. Um, also, as I, as I mentioned, their head, Egypt has been sponsoring truce talks between Hamas and Israel. They've all fallen apart. Why? Neither side trusts one another. Hamas wants Israel to lift the blockade, then they'll stop firing missiles. Israel wants to stop firing missiles, will lift the blockade, right? So we're actually in a really, really tough spot. And guess who is suffering? People. Two million people in an abject, dire poverty. Well, what's this have to do with you and me at the end of the day, right? Well, the U.S. has always been an ally of, of Israel and is to this day, right? If extremism, if you will, extreme Islam or extreme terrorism is being fermented on the Gaza Strip towards Israel and its allies, guess what? We, <laughs> we're going to get it, right? We could, we could really could end up on the, um, on the losing end of that, okay? So, there is, um, there's a few things going on right here, and I'll leave the rest maybe with Father Turst to explain what now, how our principle, principle is going to apply. Now to Iraq. And this is the one, I was home a couple weeks, and I was on Catholic.org, 
and it had this um, it had this story about ISIS and Christians, you know, and I was like, I don't want to see anybody like that. I don't want to see it, right? I heard about it. warning, graphic material, shock. I don't want to see that. I don't want to see any blood or anything like that. Here's Iraq, here's Syria. And I decided to open it, and it just ruined my day, you know? Because I saw these images of the poor kids and um, decapitated, dismembered, and I was like, but you know what? Now I'm glad I saw it. Because we just cannot remain indifferent. Uh, Pope Francis has said in his, um, in his apostolic exhortation, there's a, what's called a globalization of indifference. People don't care, right? This is how the Christians feel now. In Syria, in 2010, a civil war, so-called, a civil war um, broke out. It's kind of like, um, it was kind of like in Egypt when you had the Egyptian Brotherhood. They called it the Arab Spring. President Assad is in, a, is, is in a Syria. He, he's the established president still in Syria. Well, a number of protests, like Ferguson, in a way beginning to be peaceful, um, they happened against the government. Government cracked down hard, brought the hammer down. Well, it formed a lot of different uh, rebel groups. Al well, and then there were some still alive. Al-Qaeda. You ever heard of them? Okay. ISIS. Right? That was another small group that all of a sudden there's a lot of rebel groups that started to fight the government. Guess who aided the rebels? United States and other countries. This is going to come back to hurt us. So the rebels now are fighting the government. They're all the way up in northern Syria now. Uh, actually, ISIS has two-thirds of the area of Syria right now. Now what they do is they want to begin what's called a caliphate. Anybody ever heard of that word? It's basically a religious rule with a caliph. It goes, goes back from the time, times of Muhammad. His last name is Baghdadi. And they want to have a caliphate in, in um, actually in many different areas, but this is where they're going to begin. In June, they took, ISIS took Mosul, and this is now where you began to see a lot of those graphic pictures, although as well in Syria. In the north of Syria, in the town of Raqqa, um, the first pictures came out of what ISIS was doing uh, to not only um, Shiites, and, um, but also Christians. So, eight Christians were crucified, in a northern town of Syria, even that of Al-Qaeda, because Al-Qaeda is now, they have distanced themselves from ISIS. Basically, you have four choices. One, convert to Islam. So when they come to your town, convert to Islam. Two, pay a very, very heavy tax. Three, flee with nothing but the clothes on your back, if you're lucky. Four, you die. And so they decide for you, and actually probably in most of those cases. But here is just an example of um, what, what their terrorist policy. And it's an extreme Sunni uh, Muslim view. Uh, and they take the, the Quran and they interpret the Quran to mean if you uh, are not going to go by Sharia law, then you must die. Okay, so you can click that off there. Back to Iraq here. In June, they come to Mosul, which is the second biggest city in Iraq, and um, a couple hundred thousand, it's a very, was a lot of Christians there, they have to leave. Um, thousands of Christians, thousands of other groups. Here you begin to see other terrible uh, decapitations. Um, they, decapi they decapitate children, they're putting their heads on poles in, in, um, in parks. Really terrible things. They would kill the men in the village, uh, and then they would take the women, and they would sell them for um, sexual slaves. This is, you, I don't know how that fits into their religious principles, but this is what's going on. And it's their goal, they still do not have Baghdad, but their, their goal is to be at Baghdad. Well, as you know, finally, on a golf course, the president comes out, right? You don't mind if I be a little critical of this? Because, because, Hundreds of thousands of innocents and even Christians are fleeing into the desert with nothing, right? 
many of their houses had spray painted an N on it for Nazarene, um, to, that they're labeled Christians. Many of them, terrible, terrible atrocities. And finally, from Martha's Vineyard, the president comes out and had that thing to say about um, the reporter who had just died. Well, due to a mounting pressure, he had decided, well, we'll have some, thank God, we'll have some um, airstrikes on this, on this ISIS group. In retaliation, this past week, um, do you have the picture of the reporter here? I think he sent a letter to back to his mother. Said he used to pray the rosary every day. And that was a way that he was able to keep his wits about him. And this past Monday, the video was released this past Tuesday. I hope, don't watch the video. It is not, it's not worth it. This picture says enough. Today, there's a report released that this man is not only from England, but he's a, a known rapper there. Brothers and sisters, you have to realize this, that ISIS, like Al-Qaeda, um, they, are, they are recruiting mercenaries, young people, to fight the cause. As a matter of fact, at a CBS, uh, I don't know if they, I think they have a CBS in England. I think it was like a CBS type store in England. They were passing out pamphlets to join ISIS, to join the fight against the infidels. There are English, now Englishmen who are Sunni, Sunni, fighting over there. There are Libyans. There are those from Tunisia. There, who knows? There might even be Americans. They're, young, they're recruiting young people with money. They stole, I, I told you, they took, four, um, they took Mosul, they also took almost uh, half a billion dollars from Mosul's bank. They have, they have our weaponry that we supplied to them. It's a very, very dangerous group. They have European passports. Do you know what they can do with those? My brothers and sisters, this is something that we cannot remain indifferent, certainly politically, Right? But um, also prayerfully. You just simply cannot, well, that's in the Middle East. They've been fighting for 4,000 years. They'll keep on fighting, right? And, and this past week, a number of ex CIA and FBI um, workers have said this threat that they made against Chicago, the first threat against Washington, and now Chicago, are very real. You know, I've heard some of the bishops who are over in um, the Middle East, they say, one of the, one of the most terrible things about losing Christians in their life in perspective. You have a bad hair day, it's a bad hair day. Mother Teresiano has them all the time, right? <laughs> you got a bad, bad beard day, right? Put your life in perspective. Uh, there's tremendous atrocities and, and terrorist activity going on now. That, that really, I, I would say, it's our duty to sacrifice and pray in the ways that we can in our own personal lives to make greater efforts for holiness and to be saints. Thank you very much. Well, just the two remarks. Now I'm going to put together the situation that Father Augustino was talking about, namely about Jefferson, Missouri, and Staten Island, and what Father Anthony was talking about over the Middle East. That's going to be one subject. And I'm just going to make one comment on that. And then I'm going to talk about the Ebola virus and about the immigration together, a curious way, and make one remark about that. So I'll, I will restrain myself. First thing, on, with regard to the, the situations of great violence in the Middle East and the situations of racial tension and possible murder, questions of self-defense here. What the Catholic tradition insists upon and most secular authorities cannot make the same claim, and not all religions can make the same claim as we just saw with regard to Islam. What the Catholic tradition insists upon is the inviolable dignity of every innocent human life. And hence, what we do is we start with the Bible, we start with Revelation, and we say the fifth commandment is really clear. It says, thou shalt not kill, but that requires interpretation because we allow, as Father Augustino was suggesting, for self-defense of an individual and even self-defense of a nation, so that we take the fifth commandment to absolutely forbid the destruction of any innocent human life from womb to tomb. 
mindful that not all life is innocent. There are aggressors in the private domain, the complicated situations both in Staten Island and in Jefferson City, the enormously more complex situations in Middle East politics and in other parts of politics. The Catholic tradition has always insisted upon the legitimacy of self-defense and the legitimacy of national self-defense. Let me give you what I regard as a very useful principle for your own arguing about these things when you're in some conversation. I can get an awful long way out of this statement of the principle, whether I'm dealing with a fellow religionist or whether I'm dealing with even a pure secularist. And here's the principle. No private individual is permitted to use lethal, self, lethal force if public authority is present. So if public authority is not present, an individual may use lethal force. If a robber comes in your house brandishing a gun and shooting things up, the individual may use self-defense because the police aren't there. But you're using it against an aggressor in the act. But if public authority is there, one has to defer to public authority, and one has to keep public authority under some very strong protocols. Whether the police in Staten Island or in Jefferson City are operating under those protocols, I don't know. That fact has got to be found. But police in, are entitled to use lethal force so long as they're operating under the right protocol, because we don't want private individuals to do so. The situation both in Staten Island and in Jefferson City, the danger is, is that the public authority, the police officer, is acting like a private individual and not acting according to the protocol. Similarly, when we get to the Middle East, the problem in a way is the way in which the United Nations has been so politicized and is unable to do its job. I mean, in the map that Father Anthony was showing us, this one and the previous one, what you have are nations operating like private individuals. And so the Israelis are forever claiming that the people in Gaza started it, the people in Gaza are claiming that the folks in Israel started it, and one could do a similar analysis with his remarks about ISIS and about the other uh, groups that are responsible, at least in a certain time, in joining in the violence chain. When nations are operating like private individuals, I think they fall under the same basic rubric. No private individual may use lethal force except in self-defense when the public authority is not there. Frankly, what the popes have been saying, 1964 when Pope Paul VI came to the United Nations, John Paul II came to the United Nations, Benedict XVI came to the United Nations, we have every reason to think Pope Francis, 2015, a year from now, will be at the United Nations. And trying to talk them into stopping being so politicized so that they can serve as an appropriate restraint on violence. But right now, when they're so politicized, they have made it impossible for themselves to serve as an authority. So without claiming to resolve the whole issue, I think there's a Catholic principle that at least lets us how to talk about it. Let me go on to the second point, the immigration and the Ebola virus. In these cases, I take it to be the fact that we've got a public policy problem in the one case of public health, in the other case of enormous numbers of people who want to come in, and that the points that Father mentioned follow from, namely a person who's been arrested for being a, an illegal immigrant, deported, if he comes back, he's in more serious legal trouble, the risk of violence on the far end, the risks of severe punishment on this end granting all of that. But I take these two issues in a way to be matters of public policy. And then they spawn sometimes issues of violence or issues of corruption. But notice in matters of public policy, one of the things that I think that we Catholics have a tremendous respect for, and this comes especially from the tradition of reason, although the popes have encouraged it. What is in the tradition of reason is the tradition of rule of law. It doesn't help to be ruled by chaos. Civilization gets dragged down, the standard of living of everybody goes down. We need to have rule of law. And in a two-party system or a multi-party system, it means the law is above every party. Every party must respect the law, and then within the political debate, one must make appropriate political decisions. So whether it be on public policy questions about public health, 
what have we got to do? Here, thankfully, we've pointed out any number of instances of charity, and that's the part that we can do best, the prayer and the sacrifice. But in terms of talking about the issues, in terms of morality, I think what we have to say is we need to encourage political debate that is civil so that we can decide how to find yet more appropriate ways of dealing not only with the ending of the epidemic, but of the preventive medicines. There's much better ways of funding most of those things, and part of that will come in the political debate when there are ways to make these things available, especially in the parts of the world where the sales of these things is not going to generate enormous profits for the pharmaceuticals. But there has to be political pressure put on to make possible the widespread use of appropriate pharmaceuticals to solve these kind of issues. With regard to immigration, I don't know how your families came to this country. I'm a Polish extraction. My family came about a hundred years ago in all four of my grandparents in one way or another. And what I say to myself when I look at the immigration questions is what I think the Catholic bishops are saying, is that we have to have a whole lot more charity with regard to the possibilities of immigration, but we have to insist on the rule of law. If you don't insist on the rule of law and orderly processes for these things, all the things that the very reasons why the people are coming are going to get overrun. And yet one has to find interesting ways, creative ways, to make a much more charitable system of immigration so that you don't end up in some of these nasty circumstances. It will be accompanied by the political resources. I, I really think that what's driving the whole thing, of course, is the drug trade. And so until we get the drug trade settled here and reduce the amount of pressure that's going on in some of these others, you're going to find the mafias which produce the pressure, which produce some of the symptoms that you're describing here. So my point for these two, again, is not can I solve the problem not easily, but can I recommend what the Catholic contribution to the debate is? Insisting on the rule of law and insisting on really civil discourse returning it from the very politicized situation we've got now, where you can't get a good political solution, nobody's talking. I hope that's helpful. Maybe we've got some good questions about it. I'm sorry, I didn't bring my resources, so I'm going to say check Wikipedia, okay? <laughs> Boy, they update that pretty good. You know? What is the president of Iraq doing against, I, I'm guessing, ISIS? Uh, in the, in the area of, uh, around Mosul. Well, the, the president of Iraq, I think the, they just, um, either the prime, I don't know if they, the prime minister or president just resigned. So I don't even know if they have a president right now. They, they do, they do, they have a new president. I do know that Iraq, uh, they do have some special forces that are special forces trained that are in the fight. Um, I, I do know they're involved with some, uh, again, limited airstrikes over there. I don't know what their capabilities are, uh, the Iraqi capabilities. So there is some of it, but um, unfortunately when, for example, in Mosul, 30,000 uh, Iraqi soldiers whom we trained threw their weapons down. So it's, it's a very, very difficult, um, difficult area. I think I can move the, through these really quick, okay, so let's keep rolling. Is it true the Jews entered Palestine and started to take over? Well, if you remember, uh, the savior of the world uh, <laughs> was Jewish, uh, and he was born in that area, that neck of the woods, around zero, right? Or with the, with the non-calendar uh, change there. Um, but the Jews were there, and it's, it's, a very, it's a very interesting history. Again, I would... I would encourage you to just to read up on it, but the Jews were there, uh, but the area was Palestine. Uh, so now the Jews came back, and the United, I believe it was the United Nations, or in 1948, they they drew the what the country of Israel, that the boundaries now that would be a place where any Jews who were, especially after World War II. In, in Russia or Germany, they could come there and have permanent citizenship. Well, that's exactly what you know, claims to land, uh, what fueled a, a, a lot of tension, okay? Um, 
Why does the U.S. continue to fund Israel? Again, I'm not an expert on foreign policy, okay? But I think it does have something to do with stability in that region. Okay. Uh, the Kurdish struggle, um, this is a question. Um, the Kurds have, up in the north have been fighting the extremists for a long time. Are they Christian? No. Secular? No. I do believe they, they are Muslim. Um, but I'm going to check uh, Wikipedia, all right? And uh, why isn't the United States loves getting involved with, I love these honest questions. Uh, why isn't the United States loves getting involved with every, everything all over the world, especially in Syria and Israel? Well, again, it, it, I think it does point to a stability of the region. Uh, it does point to economics. As you know, we get a lot of oil uh, from the Middle East. Um, maybe not all over the Middle East, but it, it serves it's certainly the United States' purposes economically, but also, I would say, politically, uh, for us to uh, promote democracy, uh, human rights. Uh, so I think that there's a lot to that question, and it probably varies from administration to administration why the United States does get involved uh, around the Middle East. Okay, so I'll just go through this real, real quick. Um, what does it mean to offer it up? How is it relevant today? Uh, that's a question on redemptive suffering. Uh, when we offer up a little suffering that we go through, I stub my toe, oh! instead of cursing or instead of saying something bad, I can say, Lord Jesus, I offer this up, I unite this to your cross. And when you do that, it becomes something infinite. You unite it to the merits of Christ, one for the cross, and in some way that I don't know how exactly it works, but God uses that for good. Uh, he's the only one that can use, that can take something bad and turn it to, to something good. What you offer up to God, even if it's sweeping the floor, even if it's uh, whatever, when you offer it with love, it becomes something good. You can offer it for certain things. You can go to Mass and offer it up for these different things, and that helps. Um, we can't protect our own borders, and we expect to protect the whole world. Every nation has the right to protect its own borders. Every nation has that right. Uh, and the question of protecting the whole world, that has been a question ever since World War II. At the end of World War II, when we became, quote, a superpower, uh, with some responsibility of ensuring a more stable world order so that extremism, like Nazism, uh, wouldn't, uh, so the forces, uh, these evil forces, it's evil, it was evil, uh, wouldn't come to power. And there were some, some things that happened in the, in the instability after World War I that allowed that evil to fester, to grow. And so that's part of the reason why the United States took that responsibility to kind of make sure things were, were stable. Uh, did it, did, has it ever crossed the line? I'm not going to touch that. Uh, maybe it did, maybe it didn't. Uh, in, in any of these areas that we were trying to do. There's something called uh, the, um, the doctrine of containment that at, during the Cold War, the United States would go to any area where communism rose up and try to put that out. And that was called containment, meaning that we could defeat communism by containing it. Uh, and you can argue that that worked or you can argue that the current situation that we face now is an unintended uh, consequence of it. It's complicated. Um, but we, we, I don't think it's the national policy to protect the whole world, but I do think that we feel some sense of responsibility. What about the gangs and drugs here in New, New, New Jersey, New York? What can we do? People's lives are in, at, at stake. Yes, uh, what can we do? Number one, we can uh, recognize that, um, that drugs are, are part of us, part of the culture. Maybe we have family members, maybe we ourselves have, have, have come out of this. Uh, one thing that you can know is know the symptoms in your own house and try to bring Jesus Christ into your home for his starters. Uh, and, and beyond that, you know, I tell you what, man, let's build a culture of life. Um, and, uh, and drugs, you know, like Father was saying, if there was no drug market here in the United States, Mexico, Honduras, and Guatemala wouldn't have uh, the trafficking of the drugs through them, which brings a whole bunch of other things as well. So the part of the sickness, the, 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 the sickness of the heart in our country is part of the problem. What do we need to do? 
yo, bring Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, Jesus is the answer. Um, and that's not an oversimplification, but you know, bring people, Jesus who are around you, start with that. What is the difference of immigrants crossing the border in Central America versus the Christians fleeing their country in Iraq in the fear of their human life, human dignity? Also, the Vatican approved using force in Iraq. What does this mean and how far should force be used here? Uh, for the second part of that question, look up in the catechism, the uh, cause of a just war, or just war. J-U-S-T-W-A-R. Look it up, the Catholic doctrine is very, very clear. Father mentioned uh, the, the things that are necessary to declare a just war. Um, there is a time where you should take up arms. And the Catholic Church has carefully defined what those reasons are. Look it up, it's all over Google for the first, uh, for the first part, what is the difference? It's, that's a very good question. Um, there is both violent um, uh, violence in both areas. I would say that the that the situation in, in Iraq is has more gravity, is is more serious because you have a a fully militarized, religiously backed um, ideology that is drawing people from all over the world, bent on absolutely no negotiation but either your conversion or your destruction, that is a menace to humanity. Uh, and although the gangs are a menace to humanity, uh, this one seems more serious. <laughs> what does Catholic social teaching really say about illegal immigration? Why do some Catholics struggle with wanting to help these Catholics if the church asks us to help? Very good question. There's a lot of people who are very good Christians, Catholics otherwise, who do not believe what the Catholic church teaches about immigration, illegal immigration, uh, see, here's, here's, Father, maybe you can clean this up. There is the principle of, um, <laughs> uh, I forget. Um, if somebody's starving and you have two pieces of bread, you don't have two pieces of bread, you have one piece one of bread. Piece. Because that other piece of bread belongs to the person who's starving. You get me? That is called... Universal destination, it was the, on the tip of my tongue. <laughs> so if there is a situation where people are seriously starving or there is basically a war situation, we have some obligation to help. Now, the tricky situation is we should ask ourselves as a, as a nation, what is our involvement in their economic situation that they find themselves in? I would argue that there has some, that this country has something to do with it. That's a complicated. That's a complicated question. But uh, but can can we do something? I think we can. Um, and, and down down there is not that complicated. And a lot of the corruption. I'm sorry to say, but is is due in large part to our foreign policy. Uh, and, and our foreign policy has been that way for the last 50 years. Part of the doctrine of containment. We're trying to control communism, but. Uh, and I quote one of our presidents said he's an SOB, but he's our SOB, uh, uh, talking about the dictatorship in Nicaragua, and, and Nicaragua became one of those hot spots later on. Uh, so we we do as a country have we've, had, and I hope that we can find a way in, in some of the solutions. In Ferguson type protests, if they happen here or similar tragedy, is it wrong to join them? It is wrong to be a part of a riot. It is wrong to be a part of looting, peaceful protest for the sake of a just cause. Uh, but prisoners committed crimes. Shouldn't they pay for their crime? Yes. Yo, but sometimes people look scary. Sometimes crossing the street is what you gotta do. I feel. Is this wrong? The answer to this question, yo, you, gotta, you do what you gotta do, this is the Bronx. Bronx.